yourself have not talked about your interpretation of the Matrix trilogy or what you were attempting to say because you didn't want it to become dogma. In other words, you wanted people to be free to interpret the movies the way they wanted to and to have a freedom to do that. And as soon as the movie maker gets up and says, this is the meaning of the Matrix and this is the so-and-so, that it really limits people. And I think that's a very wise thing to do. Yeah, I mean, you make a work of art and you want it to be provocative. You want people to dialogue about right. it. You don't want them to rely on somebody to tell them what it is. Or right. It's like the whole nature of the movie is exactly that. Right. Exactly. Perspective and pursue it yourself. Right. You know, it seems hypocritical for us to go out and tell everybody what, what it's supposed to be about or what you're supposed to think about it. Right. And... And even if I was to do it, or Andy was to do it in even the gentlest of terms and try to contextualize it as what it means to us, right? it's because by the very nature of us being the creators of it, it becomes a you know, law. It becomes right. the interpretation, and anyone else's interpretation is just some crazy individual that, that really doesn't get it. Right. I don't want to devalue anybody's opinion of it because they're all, I don't know, I think that's one of the reasons that art is a worthwhile experience. Right. So you declined to do the traditional director's commentary over the film. So Warner's then suggested that... Uh, They had a bunch of like typical DVD commentary ideas and, you know, we found... You know, we find most commentary pretty mundane, pretty boring, pretty onastic, pretty shallow. Right. And, well, uh, you know, I'm not very interested in most commentary. And and so I started thinking about it and talking to it with Andy, and we were like, well, what would be interesting? And so we had this idea that trying to create tracks that reflected our hope for the movie, which would be that the movie would inspire people to think about it right. and inspire dialogue about everything. Right. <laughs> and, and so uh, uh, we thought that basically demonstrating the range of dialogues that the movie has inspired would inspire its own dialogue about not only the Matrix, but the, the way that we talk about art. Right. And so suddenly the commentary wouldn't be just about the Matrix. It would be about something bigger, something larger. It would have a larger scope to it. And uh, so we we told Warner Brothers that, like, great! (laughs) (laughs) But, I mean, how we would go about doing that is getting um, two critics to talk about the movie who hated the movie. Right. And then two (laughs) philosophers who who saw the movie and uh, were inspired by the movie. Right. And juxtaposed those two different dialogues against each other. Right. And Warner Brothers was like, what? You want to put... Let me get this straight. <laughs> you want to put two critics who hated the movie talking about the movie for six hours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, not only because I think it'll be... They'll be interesting in... The, the dialogue and the internal way that they, they've come to these opinions will be interesting. Right. It'll be interesting to see how a critic talks about the movie and that they don't like and they don't see anything in it. And then it'll be interesting seeing how two philosophers would talk about it and 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 see something in it and see something that works in it. Right. And listening to those two perspectives, I think, uh, will be inherently interesting. Yeah, yeah. So that's what we're going to do. And as you know, it's sort of, um, it puts me in a somewhat awkward position because you and I have uh, an agreement. We spent hours discussing what I think the films mean, what you yourself, your own interpretation of the film. We have an understanding that I'm not going to discuss your interpretation of the film with anybody, that that's a private thing, and you and a few friends talk about it, and we're keeping that you know, to ourselves, so to speak. But at the same time, I'm being asked to give my interpretation in public. And I've already done that. I mean, you already came up here with a film crew and shot three hours of me giving my blow-by-blow interpretations of all three. As you know, I think it's incredibly gutsy 
because in the whole key to the Matrix trilogy, this is my interpretation, is given in really in the last 15, 20 minutes of the third film. That the Rosetta Stone is when Neo, for example, is saying of the machines, if you could only see them like I see them, they're all light. They're made of light and so on. That interpretation is the key to all three of the films. And it's incredibly gutsy because film number one, that it, so many people sort of relate to film number one because it makes sense. You think it makes sense if you don't see the other two. It seems a very simple story if you look at just film one. It's very Manichaean, actually, which is everything in the Matrix is bad. Everything outside of the Matrix is good. Everybody in the Matrix is trapped. Everybody outside of the Matrix is free. And in that very simple kind of dualistic thing, the machines are bad and they're trying to herd freedom and so on. That, and so everybody goes, wow, that's great. And then you go and you watch part two. And you get into about the part where Neo's talking to the Oracle and says, you're not human, are you? She goes, no. He says, you're a program, aren't you? She goes, yeah. And everybody starts scratching their head. Because now all of a sudden we're taken, and I've told you this, we're, in, my, this in my opinion, we're taken out of the realm of a movie and into the realm of complex literature. Because this is a very sophisticated plot now with a whole lot of pieces. And a lot of the pieces of the puzzle aren't really given until that last part of the third film. And that's where you kind of, all of a sudden, things really start to fall into place. They start to fall into place with a speech from the architect. They start to fall into place, actually, with the first speech for the Oracle, the first talk with the Oracle. Uh, Smith is a real key to all of it. Anyway, but it's that overall interpretation, which is really that body, mind, and spirit appear in the Matrix trilogy, both in their alienated forms and then in their resurrected or healed or more integrated forms, which happens towards the end of the third part. And that's why it's very confusing to some people if they don't get that overall big picture. That's why sort of part one makes sense, and then they get lost a little bit in part two and part three. So the, so I sort of stuck to that interpretation, as you know, when Josh was filming here at the loft. But then I find myself every now and then you know, having to kind of bite my lip and say, well, I happen to know that Larry agrees with me on this part or something like that. Because <laughs> I want to, you know, I want to say, well. That's what I was saying. Is like it just becomes a natural validation. Of I know. <laughs> I'm here to say that your opinion is whack. <laughs> I don't know that tall, skinny guy. He just came in off the street and started talking to Cornell. We have no bloody idea who he is. Um, and we've talked about the nature of interpretation as well. And then the sort of more integral of context you have the more certain similar meanings can start to emerge for somebody. And, we, you know, you and I both are, you know, we're integrally informed. I mean, we share a passion for that sort of integral approach. And so I think in, without giving any of the things away, there's certain, certain areas of, of this, you know, overall production that you and I certainly see eye to eye on. Yeah, and, I, you know, it's like I, the, the third movie is, it, it has its, relevation moments but they're all based on things that have been built up through all three movies certainly the, the beginnings the little tiny introductions to each film has kind of a reflection of what each movie is about mm -hmm. and you know we say we sort of in those little tiny prefaces to each film we kind of tell the audience where we are in the journey of development. Right. I mean, if, if the Matrix is an exploration of consciousness, those little tiny bits and pieces at the beginning of each of the films sort of tries to help you map it out a little bit. Right. That, to me, is what makes it, like I say, such rich literature, that there's just multiple levels of meaning. And I think that the critics that miss it miss it on that basis. When they don't stand back and see a bigger picture, they're free to criticize it in any way they want for the same reason that anybody's yeah. free to interpret it anyway. I'm hoping that there will be some level of... that the, that the problem will be somewhat self-evident. That, you know, in the way that you describe things as having an interior and an exterior, yeah. and the way that the Matrix kind of is in a lot of ways about that. And the exterior tends to remain very obvious, very surface-based, observation-based. And I'm kind of hoping that these two dialogues that will be juxtaposed will be kind of a, about an exterior and an interior. Right. And the critics will be 
essentially interested in surfaces, and philosophers will be interested in interiors. Right. Well, let's certainly hope so, but, you know, we'll just go down there and bash around. Yeah. Um, are you and your dad still reading uh, SAS? Yeah. Very cool. I'm about, we're about halfway through it. I very cool. It's very good. Had a very good, uh, very interesting sort of discussion about you and what I perceive to be uh, your relationship to Hegel, which could be completely wrong. <laughs> I, I kind of went on this riff with him about it. Does he have an interest in that? Did he? Yeah. Yeah, of yeah. course. We talked, about, we talked about it. And, and uh, it's definitely, I would say, the, the book that has the most in it that yeah. I got the most out of. And, and that has kind of, I think, the, the clearest, developed the clearest yeah. book. Yeah. I think what happened with SCS, it was the first, really the first book that all of the books leading up to that were, in a sense, dealing with a particular piece of what that book pulls together to kind of integrate them all and some something sort of changed for me at that point because seeing that more kind of comprehensive picture brought just a really great deal of clarity yeah but by god there's so much of it and sometimes people get by the time they get to chapter five or six they've forgotten chapter one or two three and well you're pretty good about going back i mean that the solid tradition of i think good writers that write in these veins. They remind you when you have to be reminded of it. Yeah. When they, they create their own language and they remind you of the definitions of the language when you need to have it reminded. Right. I, mean, I don't think many people... <laughs> I, mean, I love that you, in this book you can, you can struggle with very difficult concepts and then and there'll be a sentence that'll use a word like you have to use the word super especially <laughs> <laughs> as a technical defining term <laughs> but you have your interest goes back to all of these i mean the people that are dealt with in that book like hegel and nietzsche and Plotinus, all that this is a love of yours i mean this is something that you've been interested in is you know as at early age just like i was i mean it's all kind of coming together in a certain sense yeah, well, I mean, I've been looking, looking for a reason, <laughs> <laughs> which is something. Yeah, so I was talking to my father about it, and it's, it's like with the four quadrants. What still holds the quadrants together is still that zero, that omega point, that center of the x y axis, right? There's not four right. big bangs. <laughs> There's right. only one. Right. And it sits there exactly in the center. But it's interesting in some ways that's the only, I mean, that's why Schopenhauer is so dead on. It's like that point is the only point worth talking about in some regards because <laughs> it's the beginning of it all. It unites right. all four quadrants. Right. It pulls everything together. Right. If you don't have it, then it's, they're all separate again and exactly. there's nothing. Exactly. <laughs> but you can't. If you make it entirely about that, then you're making it about nothing. Yep. Because you can't know. Right. And that sort of that empty ground is, is the same as that original point. Yeah. Which is your original face. Yeah. So it's interesting that he, you talk like he does, like Schopenhauer does. You can talk so well about the quadrants, and yet when you talk about the thing that holds them all together, it becomes difficult to talk about. Yeah. Well, and, the, and that's the thing that holds them all together is, is not something, you know, it's not another quadrant in addition to those. It's not something outside of it. I sometimes say it's the page on which the diagram is written or something like that, but that's just another... I think another... it's the origin point of them. The thing that pulls... The yeah. thing that allows you to say that they're all... These four quadrants relate to each other and are not just separate things floating off by themselves. Absolutely. The thing that holds them is that zero point. Exactly. And that zero like, point... That was the... In the beginning of the third movie, when that there's like we we're like, how do we start the third movie, which is going to talk about <laughs> the things that are so hard to talk about? Right. It's like okay, you go to black, and then you have to have a moment of big bang, and right. whether that's the origin of everything, the origin of thought, the origin of consciousness, whatever it is, in that moment, it's like from that nothing to everything is everything. 
And that's then that's the same origin point. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Yeah, there's a great line that everybody knows: ontogeny and phylogeny. Yeah. But there's also microgeny, which means the moment-to-moment movement through the sequence. And so, for example, if I see an apple. The microgenetic movement is there's an impulse, there's an impression, there's a simple sensation, then I form an image that I might think about an apple as a concept, and then I can have my personal reactions to it, etc. And microgeny recapitulates ontogeny, which recapitulates phylogeny, which recapitulates cosmology. Mm -hmm. So from the Big Bang up to this moment is all that same sequence of the unfolding of the four quadrants, but it's also repeated moment to moment out of that empty origin right now, moment to moment. And that's the interesting thing about it, because when you discover your original face, face you had before the Big Bang, then you've discovered that moment as well. That's the Satori moment. That's realizing this radical self that's all-embracing and all-encompassing. And out of that moment to moment, all that things emerge. All the quadrants emerge, all the levels, all the lines, that same origin point that you're talking about. And that is what holds the quadrants together, because the quadrants are just dimensions or aspects of that origin. Moment to moment, this very moment now. Yeah. And that's where you gave a pictorial representation at the beginning of the third. Well, we tried to. <laughs> <laughs> well, these, but, but you've been interested in this as long as I have in terms of, you know, the span of your adult life. When you and I first talked on the phone, when we first connected, as you know, we spent three and a half hours, and it was just nonstop talking about all these things. And it's so... Um, couple of chatty cathies. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, you know, it was like it was one of those great moments where you meet someone and you talk and you have a, a confirmation or a validation about about the world. Right. It's like you have connection. You have instantly a feeling of fellowship or community. And, right. And, uh, it was nice. Yeah. It was a nice feeling. It's a nice feeling. Yeah. Ongoing. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting, too, that um, I was talking to my friend Jeff, the artist on The Matrix, and talking about how human beings have this, uh, you know, we are, we're social. We're social animals. It's like so much of our realities are construction based on communication. We have a point of view about the world and we validate it through finding another human being that has a similar point of view and thus we say, ah! Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, because we can't really know anything. Yeah. yeah. So if we just get enough people together and we can believe in castles in the sky. Right. Until I get this tape back. <laughs> <laughs> so I realize that I sound like a dork. <laughs> reciprocity is what it is. A little That's reciprocity. Tips are based on. That's right. <laughs> you help me with this DVD. I talk to you. <laughs> but, I don't talk to people. You don't talk to That's people. That's right. <laughs> Showing how much we care. <laughs> <laughs> mutual extortion is like yeah, mutual extortion. <laughs> mutual but, exploitation. But I think I think this is very sweet though, is that seriously, we I don't think that we either one of us would be doing this if we hadn't really struck up a almost an immediate resonance because as you know I've turned down doing anything public at all whatsoever for over twenty five years and doing the interview with you know on, on tape on film for you and, and Josh was the first time I've done this and you don't talk about this stuff to anybody who's well known. And so no, I we have a we have a very similar outlook on the the nature of celebrity and public right. experience. Right. That it that it's not such a great thing. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean what's so amazing is how well, I mean, it's pretty easy to understand how uh, academic philosophy can avoid the limelight, but 
how, you know, the co-director and writer of you know, the most astonishing movie experience of the last several decades can avoid the limelight. You were talking about when you were over in Japan for one of the openings, and, and they're like, you know, everybody and we're else. actually standing next to press row. Exactly. It's like the entire row of, like, cameras and video cameras, and all these reporters are standing there, and we're, like, standing right next to them. Right. <laughs> And everyone's like, and this woman is watching as Carrie Ann and Keanu come down the aisle, and they're all taking pictures and very excited. And then Joel Silver comes down the aisle, and she's like, oh. The producer. Yeah. gets very excited who's standing next to me, this Japanese woman. She's like, oh, it's Joel Silver, Joel Silver, Joel Silver. <laughs> I'm like, oh, who's he? <laughs> like, she's elbowing you and saying, look, look, there's the producer. Oh, God. And you're sitting there, you're, you're appropriately excited, of course. Oh, of course. <laughs> well, I had to find out who he was first. Who is he? <laughs> oh, he's responsible for the Matrix. <laughs> oh. No, uh, I mean, not, not to say anything bad about Joel. No, understood. Our leader. Or, or the Japanese woman, for that matter. No, no, she was very <laughs> sweet. She was very nice. But I, I felt very happy with the fact that they didn't know who we were. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, incidentally, I, well, wait, you're now, but you're not just, you know, for uh, things that I believe are public knowledge, you're not planning on going back and, and filming any more Matrix things for the foreseeable future right now. Uh, you'd, mm-hmm. you'd film the three of those in one long, you know, intense five-ish year period, and he's sort of taking a break from that right now, yeah? Yeah, the actual full span is probably ten years yeah. that we've been working on them. Yeah, that's just, you know that's that's the story. And I don't know. We'll see yeah. down the line. I, I'm so hoping the, that I I recover enough to even want to make another movie. Yeah, before. yeah. So you just sort of wait and see what unfolds. Yeah. Yeah. I can't say that. I don't know. I used to love movies. <laughs> I used to go to movies all the time. I used to. You know, watch hundreds of them, hundreds a year, and now I, I can't stand them. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody asked me, what did The Matrix, you know, do to us in terms of watching other movies? And I, probably the most distorting aspect of having made these films is looking at movies and just feeling such a lack of ambition on the part of the people who are making them. Yeah. That I kind I kind of think like why bother? Yeah. Yeah. It's like what well, if they can't generate the ambition and energy, why should I be interested? Yeah. You know, I don't know. Yeah. Well, I you know, look, I I think that's an occupational hazard of any time you try to bring some sort of quality or excellence to anything. I mean, I, frankly, I feel the same way about writers, you know. I mean, I bust my ass on these things, and I pick up books um, and read through it. I go, Jesus, this person, that you know, I could do this, you know, between stoplights. I mean, this is, this is just horrible. And <laughs> yeah, which is interesting, because at the same time, that is the thing that really enables you in the beginning. It's like Kubrick used to talk about how, you know, when he first started, he would go to the movies and he'd say, Christ, that was crap. I could do that standing on my yeah, head. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> And it's like, and if, you know, you forget that crap is there before and after you, you do it. <laughs> but uh, and before you do it, it's like, whoa, it's inspiring. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then after you do it, it's just... It's still there. Yeah, kind of like uh, defeating in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, before I forget, what was your take on Hegel? <laughs> oh, we were talking about how, well, it's just very complicated, but essentially the, uh, the Hegelian idea that the development of everything is leading towards the singularity of the individual, right? Yeah. It's the whole process, that mystical... You know, that arrows that you talk about that's underneath everything has been bringing us towards the development of self-awareness and consciousness. Well, I guess consciousness and then self-awareness. Yeah. And how that development 
that, uh, I guess in your terms, it would be the holonic development. Yeah. Leads towards the singularity. It's like the base leading towards the singularity of the individual. Right? Uh, well, but not, but individuality is not, not an omega for me. It's sort of a, on a continu- Correct. Yeah. That is. But, but I mean, uh, I mean, you see the development, uh, well, you see that progression as a development. I think so. From what you've said so far, I think so, yeah. But then, whereas he arrives, he, you know, he basically says, here I am, I'm Hegel, I'm self awareness, I'm, I'm the omega point incarnate. You then turn around and reverse out of that pyramid. Through further development. Yes. Yeah. Which is which is an interesting shape. Yeah. Yes. That was yeah. the nature of our discussion. Yeah. Because generally people want to be describing things that, you know, reach a pinnacle and not then turn around and get out of the pinnacle. Right. Yeah, I know. It's just an occupational hazard of when people get into evolutionary developmental thinking. They sort of find themselves perched miraculously on top of the heap. And I find ourselves miraculously about halfway up the heap, and then more than that, the heap is unending in the manifest domain. You get off of the evolutionary spiral, which is very important to come to terms with, but you find freedom from it by finding that origin point we were talking about that underlies all of it. And that doesn't exist in time. That doesn't pop out at the top in time. That's the timeless ground of all of it. And so, you know, and I... Right, but the path there is a development of an ever re-expanding path. In a sense, sure. You, Whereas you, you start off and you're, you know, we're going from base matter, yeah. atoms, molecules, cells, right. living organisms, yep. they go through the, up to the triune brain. And, you know, that that is a progression, a yep. developmental progression, which kind of suggests a value statement there. Yep. Leading towards this this entity, this leading towards Hegel. <laughs> 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 leads to Hegel's family, then leads to Hegel's tribe. Then oh, God. Hegel's <laughs> nation state, and then to the world. And, yeah. You know, the non-dual awareness. Which yeah. Then brings you back to the, the super base element, the non-dual awareness. The, one of the main differences between anybody writing now and, and somebody writing even the time of Schopenhauer is just, you know, science keeps progressing to the extent that we make the assumption that science finds something out about some sort of relatively objective world. Yeah. Then, you know, it's there's God, we've got so much more science we know about now, starting with the evolutionary sequence itself. The astonishing thing is that those developmentalists up to Hegel still had no conception of the geographical spans of time and all of the studies that have been done on the, the you know, Darwin was taking their ideas and applying it to biology. It would be another century before. Yeah, it's totally intuitive work. It's amazing they got as far as they did. Yeah. Just sort of with that. No, it is amazing. It's just, it's, uh, it's staggering. <laughs> <laughs> did your dad, did your dad, was he, obviously he's very bright about all these things, but has he, had he studied any of the idealists or just sort of knew in general what some of them had talked about? Uh, yeah, he's, he's read a lot. Yeah. Uh, he kind of got into Schopenhauer more because I was so into him. I yeah. Sort of yeah. Forced it down his throat. But yeah. Yeah, and he uh, he's probably more of a Marxist than I am <laughs> in terms of these ideas affecting and informing history. Right. Well, okay. Well, we'll get we'll get in the lower right quadrant then. He <laughs> Social systems theory. Yeah. Um. Okay, all right, so is Karen Is Karen coming down? Are we going to see her? Yeah, she's going to be there. Oh, cool. She'll be there. That's going to be fun. Just looking forward to seeing you again. When are, where are you guys staying? Um, we'll probably either stay at the Viceroy or we'll stay at, um, we may bring our dog. Oh, sure, you've got a dog. Yeah, I know, your dog died. <laughs> I know. got one. <laughs> This is the balance of the universe. <laughs> so, so, and the viceroy doesn't allow dogs, so you might stay someplace else. Is that yeah, right? yeah, it does not. So okay, it might, we might stay somewhere else. Where are you guys? I'm gonna stay at the standard. I'm just going down by myself. I'm gonna stay at the standard. The standard? Yeah. 
the one in uh, West Hollywood? I think so. That's a hipster place. You bet. And a hipster dude. Yeah, absolutely. Me and me and West Hollywood made made for each other. Metrosexual that you are. I'm metrosexual, and exactly. I was going to try to arrange a dinner with Joel because I think it could be. That'd be great. You know, fun. That'd be great. The center. If you actually are flying over the Getty Center, you can see Joel's house. Just pretty cool. Wow. The red box. <laughs> So okay, I'm free. I'm free that Friday evening, and then all Saturday and Saturday evening, and Sunday and Sunday evening. So doing some socializing. Well, I thought since I'm down there, you know, might as well. I don't get out much. 